the cellar of Parsons Brewery. It smells damp. It's thick. It's quiet. Every movement that you make echoes from the walls because the walls are this rough, worked stone. It's porous and it seems to have um, absorbed some of the beer or the moisture from the ground below. That smell is strong. It sticks with you. It smells like decay. Like death. Welcome to Melting Plot, an actual play podcast that features a cast of characters randomly selected from popular fiction. Each season, our heroes attempt to survive an apocalyptic scenario to find out how their characters might handle themselves at the end of the world. If you're new to Melting Plot, I recommend that you start at the beginning of the season so you can experience the story the way the players do. This is season two, and Middle Earth is in peril. Frodo was unable to destroy the One Ring, and Sauron's army covered the world in hatred and darkness. What little hope remains is tied to the fate of a few heroes willing to resist. But will it be enough? Bruce and Jasmine, you sit in the darkness, waiting. You hear all sorts of sounds above, all manner of violence. And then you see Bones as he descends the stairs slowly. There's just enough moonlight that shines through from the rooms above that it silhouettes him as he walks down the stairs. And though it's dark, you think you see blood on his hands as he fully enters the cellar. There's a moment that passes between the three of you where no words are spoken. Jasmine is crouching behind Raja with a crossbow in one hand and her fingers woven through Raja's fur. And she sees Bones come down the stairs, um, his hands kind of shiny in the moonlight and his shoulders slumped. And she stands up from behind Raja and her arms kind of droop to her sides and she makes eye contact with Bones as best she can in the darkness. And she just kind of gives him a questioning look. Is is he gone? He let the monster follow him out of the bar, but it, it, it caught up to him. It's horrible, but it's gone. It's clear. We need to continue on. We need to get... We need to get out of here. We need to take this opportunity. He can't have died in vain. Jasmine nods and tugs on the rope that she has put around Raja's neck to kind of lead him through his blindness and looks at Bruce and says, yeah, we'll go. Let's go. Bruce lets out a a sigh and his head hangs down and he just kind of nods silently. You exit out of the cellar, out of Parsons Brewery. The three of you would see that um, case of beer. And there once was 12, now 11. It is worth some coin, but it's hard to carry. It also would provide you uh, liquid hydration if you, um, if you care. But even seeing it just kind of reminds you. As you leave Parsons Brewery, head out into the street, something tells you to turn left. You don't look back down the right path, down where Archer ran. I don't think you need to see it, especially Bones, who's already seen it. And as you turn left, you leave Archer behind. You can hear battle or some violence happening somewhere distant in either the city or near the gates. You can hear the hooves of horses, and you can hear that monster. Whatever those horses were carrying, they seem to have found the monster. The monster seems to have found them. Somewhere high above where you assume this is happening, you see a tiny red bird flying circles around the scene. Leaving the brewery, Bones sees something shining in the moonlight, and he realizes He'd totally forgotten about his shield. He goes over and and picks it up 
And as he turns it over to put it on his back, he sees the blood on his hands has wiped away onto the shield. And he just can't help but feel that he could have done something more to prevent all this. As Bones is picking up the shield, Bruce will walk over lightly, touch him on the shoulder, and say, Come on, it's time to go. Jasmine will look up and get a visual on Iago flying around in the sky, and she will look the opposite direction for any cracks or breaks in the city walls where they could maybe sneak through and go in the opposite direction of the fight. And they start making their way that way. You sneak out through the cracks in the wall. There was once a wall that ringed the city, and most of it has kind of broken away or crumbled. The part that you find um, has a fairly intact section of the wall still, but there is a crack that runs right down the center of it, and has crumbled away near the bottom. So you can quite easily sneak out through it. It actually um, will take you a little bit south and a little bit west, which will cross the river that served um, the bathhouse. So you're familiar with the side of the city, at least in some small way. South, you can see the rolling hills, um, continuation of mountains at some point, uh, maybe the suggestion of forest, top of the canopy that you see in the distance. As you turn to your left now, which would be um, back along the city wall, you can see Iago still searching. You can still hear that combat too. You can still hear the violence. But it's far from you now. It seems like if you were to move quickly, you could get free of it. Of course, you'd be leaving your horse behind, but... I was just going to say, are we, we're going the opposite way from the horse then. Yeah, it's likely that the conflict is taking place near where the guard tower was. Um, probably because... That's the last spot that the riders would have seen Iago. They wouldn't have seen him when he kind of swooped into the streets at Parsons, and that's then where the monster finds them. It's not likely your horse will survive this anyway. Once they're through the crack in the wall and safely on the other side, Jasmine looks to her companions. We're not going to make it very far on foot. We don't, we don't, we lost, we left our horses behind. Um, But, but there's a, there should be a dock Nearby, we can take a boat. I'm, I'm sure you're right. Eh? This would have been a trading hub. I'm sure that's how goods got into the city, mostly. You can actually see one just on the bank. This was a um, small trading hub, but it is nestled into where the Gladden River meets the Anduin River. So um, it's on a fairly traveled path. You do see a dock, and perhaps down at the dock, you do see several fishing boats. Jasmine starts heading that way. You walk down to the docks just as the sun starts to peak over Mirkwood, which you can see now many, many miles off to the east. There are boats here, and there are several that could carry you. There's a, enough room in each of them for three people, easy. Um, they're just kind of uh, long boats or canoes, things that you could steer with oars, which you can see right there. Jasmine looks at a couple of the boats floating in the water and says, what do you guys think? Boats? I think we'll go faster this way. Boats will be much faster. I, I think this one would be most suitable for our conditions. Bones points to a long boat, what we would consider a canoe. Time is of the essence. We need to beat that sunrise or they'll see us. Bruce shrugs and says, boats it is. You pile into the boats and you kick it off the dock and start down the Gladden, which will connect to the Anduin and then take you south, hopefully right up against Fangorn. As the boat passes the edge of the city and carries out you out into a part of the river that connects to the Anduin, you can see uh, the front entrance to the city itself, the one that you entered on and the one that you heard the horses at. They have now seemed to descend somewhere into the city, but as you, um, as your vision breaks the, the wall, you can see now the conflict that's happening there. There are maybe half dozen riders, and they have spears and traditional Easterling wear. Now, Jasmine, you realize that the Easterlings are after you from Erebor. It's not just orcs. It's Easterlings, too. But they're fighting that big creature. And although they're throwing their spears, and a couple of them uh, 
maybe sink in an inch or two into its hide. They're doing largely nothing to this creature. Iago is circling overhead, and you see as the riders start to pile in on the creature, spears or swords swinging, trying to fight it off, and the thing is uh, decimating them, tearing them apart, ripping them off their horses. You see it as it bites one man in half and its tail swings around and the bone spur impales another off of his horse. You can see a couple of the horses now as they just run, just leave the city, try to get free. One of the riders also attempts to leave and the creature chases him down. By the time the creature is uh, fully consumed or fully defeated the riders, you've now made it far enough out of the city that it no longer threatens you. You can see Iago still circling. He looks now like a vulture, watching over the bodies of the riders, waiting for the monster to descend back into the city and sleep once again. I think the boat journey takes you several days to get to Fangorn. It's a long ways, but you guys can keep traveling even through nights because the river's going to take you south. As the days go by, mostly in silence or um, forced conversation between you, you uh, get to the end of your rations. And it's interesting because you didn't have enough rations for the three of you when it was Jasmine, Bones, and Archer. Once Bruce and Raja returned, started to run out of food, and now that Archer's gone, you have a little bit more. And it takes you up until you reach a day or two out from Fangorn. You start to get hungry as you eat the last of your rations. At some point during this journey, you see a dark figure overhead. You think of the tails of dragons. It's got these large leathery wings that stretch out way longer than uh, any bird. Long, hooked tail. You've heard stories of the Nazgul. You assume this is one of the Knights from Mordor that is surveying the land. It reminds you how dark things have gotten. It passes overhead, disappears somewhere heading west. The days are long and tedious um, as they gently flow down the river. Bones finds himself looking for things to keep his mind busy. He can't help but begin to remember the care that he'd planned on giving uh, before everything kind of fell apart. And he looks and sees Raja sniffing at the air, kind of clumsily, trying to get a bearing on his situation. And as the days have passed, he also notices that the Bruce has become injured sometime between when they were together in the forest and when they uh, reunited back in the city. And more so for his own good offers to try and take care of that while they have downtime on the river. Raja's critical injury is, I think, severity three, right? Yeah, I think so. so it's pretty mm-hmm. tough. Bruce's is just severity one. So who do you want to start with? I will go ahead and start with Bruce. And I believe, so that would be an easy, right? Bruce's? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. That is a success with four advantage. He just has a minor infection. You have enough um, supplies in your bag to treat that fairly easily. Maybe you um, stitch uh, a couple of stitches in there to hold it shut. Not not much of an injury, really. Raja's critical is much worse. So uh, Raja's takes you a couple of days to deal with. So as you begin, go ahead and give me a roll. This is a severity three. And so it's a hard check. Jasmine would be helping with this. You weren't helping with Bruce? I, well, I thought about it too late. He don't nope, too late. It. Okay. Yeah. No, does, fine. Sorry. Does, you were just staring at the water. Um, she was staring at Raja. Actually, while you could help with uh, Archer before, because you could like run water and clean rags, like how do you in this boat? How can you? How, what do you do to help? Jasmine would be uh, assisting Bones by just being a calming presence for him, running her fingers through his fur, and keeping him calm, scratching behind behind his ears, that type of thing. And just, like, making sure that he doesn't overreact to somebody tinkering with his eyes. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you can throw a blue die in. Does Bruce have any supplies, ointments, anything 
Bruce has nothing. You got nothing. Yeah, sure. on your back. Oh, because you Bruce, were Hulk. Yeah, yeah, Bruce literally would have yeah. nothing. He doesn't even have his notes. What do you no. do here? <laughs> I lost my backpack, lost my research. I was lucky to find yeah. my glasses. <laughs> for yeah. He searched <laughs> for his for stuff, but yeah, I did not. You don't even have good clothes. He does have <laughs> the knowledge to do it. I, I think you could probably give him... He's not going to be able to add anything while you're moving. If you happen to, if this doesn't work and you have to do it again in Fangorn, he might be able to help by just finding like some. Onions. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, this is this is going to work out just great. That sounded way more sarcastic than it was. Oh no, it's it's beautiful. Five success, one triumph, and a threat. The triumph actually allows you to cure another uh, critical, but I don't think Raja has one. So once you pull everything out, once you clean his eyes and get whatever gunk has kind of like festered there, he, he should be fine. And actually, even at the end of whatever first day that you're working on him, his eyesight seems to return and um, the redness is, is really gone by the morning. He blinks a couple of, you know, I mean, his eyes have been dried, so like it takes him a while to actually get full vision back. Um, but by the time you get to the bank of uh, the river where you're stopping to move on foot towards Fangorn, you notice that he is he is 100% cured. Can we just admit that I'm a better vet than I am a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> the last few days pass and you pass uh, the forest of Lorien. And it looks like because of the curve of the river that you'll have to get out and make the last final day's journey on foot. But where you pull the boat up you can see Fangorn far off in the distance. And the land that you um, pull up on is open plains. You're in Rohan now. The forest looms in front of you. It's about a day's walk or so to get there. You can see the twisted, gnarled trees, the branches that reach out much farther than they should normally maybe uh, descend, reach down into the ground and become roots. This forest is so old that the trees have been allowed to grow unchecked. Plants that grow in a wild manner. You can see how dense it is inside. If you thought Mirkwood was dark, this is far worse. Bruce with his hands on the side of the boat, looking off towards the forest, looks up rather soberly and just says, well, welcome to the forest of Fangorn. I'd like to say that it's easy sailing from here, even though we're getting off the boat. But uh, obviously, you can see that this uh, this forest is a different place. We have a lot ahead of us. I'm gonna need all of you to keep an eye out for some way that we can actually get underground. Or we're gonna have to find um, a fairly rare growth on a very elderly tree to even be able to attempt what I'm thinking. Uh, we need to make for this antidote for your father, Jasmine. <laughs> what do you mean we have to go underground? You didn't say anything about going underground. Maybe I'm surprised we made it this far. That comment wounds Bones a little bit, realizing that we all didn't make it this far. Jasmine also winces, considering that they nearly lost both Raja and Bruce at one point, too. In the past couple of weeks, Jasmine has felt the loss from when she thought Raja and Bruce are gone, and now Archer being gone. The entirety of your group, save for Bones, has been lost to Jasmine at least once, and although some have returned, some will not. The growth that you're looking for grows in the roots of very, very ancient trees. And it only grows in very specific conditions, which are um, underground in some fairly um, heavily damp locations. So uh, the specifics are um, going to make this difficult. The growth also is a rare growth and what it does is it seems to um, sap the energy from the tree. Once it grows too big, the growth starts and um, kind of dissuades the tree from growing any bigger above ground. Um, but a lot of the life force of the tree then grows into that growth itself. So the condition is rare. So even if you found the right place for it, uh, finding the actual growth um, is not a sure thing. But these are the only trees in the known world, at least to Bruce, that grow old enough and large enough to be able to do so. As the boat pulls up the shore, we start to unpack our meager belongings and kind of set up a, a small base of operations. It's uh, unsafe to light a fire in the forest, they say. 
That's the rumor, at least, so it's much better to take camp for the night and head in in the morning. Even in the shadow of the forest, as the sun starts to set and casts its shadow towards you, you can feel how oppressive that forest is. You can almost hear it whispering. Limbs creak. They echo. They seem to talk to each other. Jasmine, as she's sitting with the group, is pondering how many close calls they've had and how some of them resulted in in permanent loss. And she looks at Bruce and Bones both and she kind of shakes her head and, and says, you know, it's almost funny to think that if I don't come out of this alive and I can't save my father, at least Jafar won't get me. It's a small comfort, I guess. The next morning comes, and it shines its light on the forest in front of you, and it seems a little bit less oppressive in the daytime. Um, But even so, as you step into it, and your first couple of steps enter Fangorn, you realize the, um, once again, the depth of of how tight the forest itself is. And Bruce, now, like, you're even starting to feel a little claustrophobic by it. Everything is so tight around you, and it's almost as if there are corridors because uh, where the where the trees grow, their roots kind of spread out and dance around the forest floor for a while. So you either have to pick your way over them or follow these natural corridors that have just been made as the roots kind of grow within themselves. You descend into the forest and very quickly become turned around and um, really, although you're not trying to um, path find your way through it, you're just searching, um, you, you realize how quickly you get lost here and, um, and that's okay for you. It's okay because you, you know that um, you need to get lost to find what you're looking for and you'll have to find your way out at some other point. As you piece your way through the forest, you eventually reach um, a small branch of the Limlight River which is, um, there are two rivers that run through Fangorn, one that runs on the northern portion and the other that kind of runs a little bit more southward. Limlight is the uh, northernmost. You reach a branch of it, which is a good sign because uh, where there's a river, there is additional moisture and all you need to do now is find the big tree and the big cave and so forth. You follow it up river. Shortly it becomes, uh, as it um, reattaches to the main mass of the river, becomes a fairly thick running river, fairly wide. As it flows through Fangorn, you start to hear the echo of it now through the forest. You can no longer hear the trees because of the sound of the river. But you realize it's not just the river because up ahead there is a waterfall where the river is flowing down through. So you're now at the bottom of that waterfall. And as you pick your way up, um, kind of a winding path that takes you maybe halfway up that waterfall, which is fairly steep, the ground becomes craggy. And you can now see across um, the river. So now as you're kind of in the, um, in the rocks, uh, nestled up against the ridge where the waterfall is pouring over, you can see on the other side of the river, Um, Again, about halfway up this ridge, a platform, um, natural dirt platform, and you see that what you thought was a stone ridge, a lot of it is a tree. It's a tree trunk. You can see now that on the other side of the river from you, part of this platform is this massive tree trunk. And as you look up it, you can see the canopy of it stretch way out wider than any other tree you've seen. The trunk itself is buried half in the ground here because it's growing down the side of this ridge. This may be the ancient tree you're looking for, and this may be the perfect conditions for it. But you can't get there. You can't seem to cross it because you're on the other side of the waterfall. You could ascend, try to climb up the ridge that you're next to, and cross it from the top could go down, cross it from the bottom, and then try to climb up on that other side, although it's not an easy path. Whereas this one has kind of worked naturally up to the point that you're on. Uh, The other side looks much more craggy. You could try to jump the river, though it seems nearly impossible. I'll take vigilance checks from each of you. Difficulty's hard. Nah, we're good. We don't even want to (laughs) know. If it's going to eat me, just let it, let it come. 
Bruce got a pure wash. Jasmine? Uh, Jasmine got one threat. Raja got two advantage. Bo- bones? A success via a triumph. Bruce, Jasmine, Raja, you're looking for ways to cross. Maybe you take a, a big branch and you kind of lay it across to see if it will reach the other side like you could shimmy across and it doesn't because it's just too wide. Uh, as Bruce looks around, uh, he notices um, a stick that has fallen uh, that's actually actually quite tall, maybe 10, 12 feet. Um, and picking it up, he kind of looks at it puzzlingly, um, staring at the uh, the distance. And he looks up to Jasmine and asks... Have you ever pole vaulted before? No, um, but I'm a pretty quick learner. I could probably figure it out if I saw somebody else do it first. Bruce kind of smiles to himself and just lays the the stick down uh, as they continue to look around. Bones, during all of this, um, you see a path that circles around behind the um, waterfall, actually descends into the mountain just a little bit, and then seems to reappear on the other side. You can take that path. It would probably be the easiest way, um, but it would put you right there at the waterfall. So if you slip, well, that might be it for you. But it would be the easiest way to cross um, that you've seen so far. Bones walks up to the scene of Banner and the princess doing some kind of discussion about trying to leap the river. Banner seems to be trying to run the math on the possibility of being able to to do that. He just walks up and kind of casually points out, we could just try the path. There's a path? It could be dangerous, but it's. I think it'll be easier than trying to cross the river. It looks pretty slippery, but I think you're right. It's going to be better than trying to just cross it over a stick or trying to swim it. I think we should give it a shot. Bruce will adjust his spectacles and he says, well, I, uh, I have been running the numbers and we should definitely take that path. The path is too thin to take together. So who's going first? Um, I think someone should have that stick in case people fall, but the last person's just going to be on their own. Bones is purely motivated by the mission at this point. So he eagerly leads first across the slippery path. As you creep up to it, the roar of the waterfall is all around you. You look down and realize how high you are because you're about halfway up this waterfall. So a drop from this distance would put you uh, 50 feet or so down into the drink. Bones, you start to ease your way out onto the path. The difficulty of this is it's an either an athletics or a coordination, your choice. And it's easy, but it's upgraded because of the threat of falling. So one red die. Bones fails the check with two advantage. You see Bones get about halfway across. (laughs) And his foot slips and he just kind of catches himself on the edge of the rock behind him. His back is to the rock and he's kind of facing forward. And every now and again when the water just kind of parts in the right way, you can see him. And um, that slip where his foot has just kind of left the rock has uh, stalled him. You can go back safely, Bones, but if you want to keep going, I'll need another check. Bones is going to press on. Reckless abandon. Uh, Bones has one success. You steal your nerves. You start moving again, and it's not some short distance before you make it out on the other side. And you're free from this threat. But you look back over the chasm, and you see your two friends. You see them kind of nervously looking at the path as well, now realizing how dangerous it is, how slippery it is. Jasmine will go next. She sees Bones cross, and she braces her shoulders pretty confidently. Whether or not that's actually true is up for debate, but she's she's ready to, to tackle this challenge. I have three advantage. You step out. And you immediately slip. You immediately hit a slick patch that takes you almost into the um, waterfall itself. So as your foot lurches forward and you kind of, you know, trying to lean back, keeping your balance, the water hits you and it takes you down. And just as you start to fall, Raja grabs onto you and pulls you back to the platform. You made it barely a step. Yeah, it's slippery out there. Your heart's racing. It's 
speeding. Extremely fast. You realize a fall from this height, that would kill you. So, okay, so Jasmine's just going to steal herself and try again. One success and two advantage. This time you make it. I think you steal yourself like Bones did, and um, you just kind of, you decide, I'm going for it. No matter what, I'm going for it. So you go actually quicker than uh, Bones did at first, and you just make it. You make it across. Um, You slip every once in a while, but you decide, hey, you know what? I'm going. You get through the river. You are now completely drenched. I think Bones has a bit on his um, pant leg as his leg slipped off, but since you almost fell into it entirely, you are just soaked. Raja's pretty wet, too. It's Raja's turn. He's following you. Yep. All right. One success and two advantage for Raja. Raja makes it pretty easily. Raja plods along like a cat, keeping his balance, getting kind of wet and hating it, emerging on the other side as this kind of soaked, like, uh, droop cat thing. Soggy tiger. Shakes himself off. It's just you now, Bruce. Bruce will adjust his spectacles, purse his lips, and say, well, it's time to see how the numbers work out. Time to become one with the river. (laughs) (laughs) Come on, Bruce. No. Uh, yeah, what an what advantage. Not the end of the world. You step out onto it, and um, even before solidly putting your foot down, you realize that this is um, this is not going to happen. Not not right now. Not not yet. You need a little bit more preparation before you go out there. You back up, Bones and Jasmine, on the other side of the platform. You look at Bruce, and you see him start to hesitate. You see him, like, he'll take a step out, and then he'll kind of pull back, and he'll do that um, calming mantra that you've heard before. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. (sighs) Takes another step out, pulls it back, sets it back firmly down in place. You can do it. Two success and an advantage. Two success and an advantage. You make it across. This time, once again, just like these guys, you realize it is better just to go for it. That hesitation is what would kill you. The will to act is what saves you, and you cross the other side. When you get to the platform on the other side, you see the um, large trunk of a tree, um, as you have seen before, and you confirm that this tree is old, and you see just a portion of it. The rest of it is kind of buried in the rock wall that it's set against, and then obviously the roots carry on down the... um, the, the ridge and into some distant subterranean area. When you try to figure out how to get down to it, you do a quick glance around your surroundings and you see that one of the roots has kind of pulled up. It's so ancient that the size of the root itself is like that of any other normal tree. And it's kind of worked its way up out of the ground and as the dirt has fallen away, it's created this sort of um, round hole. Uh, big enough for a person to walk down, maybe dug out by an animal some long time ago, or maybe it's just natural. It descends into the ground. All right, look, I don't know that it's a good idea that we all go down there. Obviously, I need to go. I'll, I'll, I'll be able to recognize what we actually need, uh, and we'll know how to um, how to extract it. But as for you two, I'm not sure that it, it's, it's going to be a good idea. It's going to be safe for you at all to be down there with me. Do you want us to stay up here, outside? waiting follow always behind you i think you should stay here at the entrance and just just keep an ear out but i'm I'm gonna need some some way of seeing down there too does anybody have anything that we can use raja bumps up against his elbow kind of implying that he'll go along bruce will um pat raja on his on his front legs there uh, and look over at jasmine is it all right if he comes comes along with me he did okay with you before. You saved his life, I think. I think that will be fine. <sighs> All right. If you hear anything, just run. Leave me behind. You look down and you're now like rimrocked on this platform. The only way back is across the um, the passage again that goes under the waterfall. <laughs> or climbing <laughs> down. So, if they have to run, good luck. Doctor. I don't think you're going to get very far without these bones pulls from his doctor's bag, a, a scalpel and a, a small glass container hands them over to Banner. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. 
Bruce will nod towards Bones. Bruce turns towards the cave. Wait. Jasmine works her way over to Bruce and just gives him a quick hug and is like, be careful and good luck. Bruce, as you descend a distance into this cave, it's circular and there are roots that run all along it. These big, thick roots and some small roots. There's even these little, um, you you know, little uh, uh, motes of fungus that have grown out of the walls here or there, all with certain alchemical properties and you take interest in them. But not long after you start this passage, you realize that it branches off into all of these different paths that um, are kind of natural formations by based on how the roots have grown and kind of pulled away from the dirt. Some of them immediately collapse on themselves. Some of them um, would require you to crawl through the only gaps that remain. Some of them are fairly big and you can move easily. Raja doesn't know what he's looking for. You're not sure where it would be, so you start taking some of these paths. Can I roll an alchemy check to try to narrow it down at all? Yeah, but it's going to be daunting because I'm not sure if that's a great way to pathfind. I'll daunt it. Okay. So I have a failure and three advantage. It doesn't help you to find your way. Um, Your knowledge of alchemy tells you you're probably in the right place. um, And you know that you need to go down deeper. But that's it. So you take the paths that kind of lead maybe more downward, but immediately some of them just start to curve up or around anyway. So even based on vision, it's hard to see. And as you descend through the paths, take a couple of these winding um, sections, your vision kind of goes entirely dark as no more light reaches you and you're relying almost entirely on Raja to make it any further. Even as you travel down and the paths branch off from one another into different areas, You wonder if you could even make it back out if you needed to. It's fully dark down here. Raja sniffs forward, uh, picks his way further down, and the only comfort you have is that he's still with you. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to connect with us, You can shoot us an email at meltingplotpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Plot Melting. All music was written and produced by Zachary James Kolkman. Sound designed by Jeff Henders and Zachary James Kolkman. Jasmine from Aladdin was played by Rachel Kamstra. Bruce Banner was played by Zachary James Kolkman. Leonard Bones McCoy was played by Tippett. And I'm your host, Jeff Henders. Thanks for listening and see you next time.